Tap the good people. We are back again. Riot Starter TV, one of your favorite platforms, programs on the platform. Welcome to Black Power Media. If it's your first time coming through, make sure you subscribe to the channel because this is the place where you can get all things African throughout the diaspora. You know, we're going to make sure that we keep you with that rough, rugged, and raw. Um, man, it's been a, you know, I was hitting pretty hard with the Riot Starter TVs and I kind of slowed down a little bit. But I said I wanted to come back and I wanted to come back with something uh, that's necessary. And I think that um, we can never get too much coverage when it comes to what's going on on the continent. And I think that uh, oftentimes, you know, we kind of jump on what's popping at the time, what's popular or what the West says is popular. You know what I'm saying? What mainstream media is talking about. And if mainstream media is not talking about it, then oftentimes we miss it. Uh, tonight, I wanted to, uh, you know, deal with a, a crisis that's been going on for 30 plus years. You know what I mean? A crisis that's been going on uh, that went from genocide to post genocide to, you know, torture and kidnappings and so on and so forth. And they still kicking it live right now. Um, so what I wanted to do is I wanted to talk about Rwanda because of the fact that the last couple episodes, uh, when we dealt with the continent, we dealt with uh, what was going on in the Congo, we dealt with what was going on in Ethiopia, and um, you know, we definitely can't forget about Rwanda, and um, we're looking to cover all 54 plus countries by the time we finish doing what we're doing. So um, tonight, I wanted to bring on a couple comrades who are serious about their work, um, who, I, I hate to use the word fled, but I guess that's a safe word. Uh, they escaped what was going on over in that particular region. You know what I mean? And uh, I wanted to talk to them about their experience, uh, what took place prior and what's going on now. So without further ado, I want to introduce you all to Claude Gatabuke and Nadine Kazuba. What's happening, family? How you all doing? Great, yeah, great. Peace, peace. Uh, excited to be here. Hey, Claude, yeah, did, I, here. did I jack your name up, Claude, or what, man? No, no, you got it right. That's exactly okay. how you say it. All right, yeah. all right. Yeah. I ain't want no problems. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> but anyway. Um, nothing, it wouldn't be nothing, right? You already know. Look at that. He coming in the gate. He kicking it down already. <laughs> but, um, yeah, man, right welcome to uh, Riot Starter TV, man. appreciate y'all coming on. Um, yeah, what, what, I, what I would like to do is start off by you all giving an introduction of, of yourself, who you are, and um, you know why you qualify to to step up and talk about Rwanda. Yes, yeah, so um, usually it's ladies first, but I'll go ahead and start. Um, so uh, as as you say, you know, my name is Claude Gatibuke. I'm uh, originally from Rwanda. You know, I consider myself a global African. So just you know. Uh, like I consider a black person uh, around the world, we all have the same right to claim Africa. Uh, so I, cl I claim myself a global African, but originally from Rwanda. Um, I uh, fled the genocide, you know, the word that you used, uh, fled. I did flee. Uh, I escaped the genocide and the war in Rwanda as a young teen and um, I'm a human rights activist, you know, uh, based in the U.S., um, and also uh, uh, executive director of the African Great Lakes Action Network, which is a uh, an organization that works on, uh, you know, our focus and our mission is to bring peace, justice, and prosperity 
in the Great Lakes region of Africa, and I work uh, closely with Nadine, especially when it comes to raising awareness and making sure that the world knows. And we have a saying that, you know, the world must know. Um, I had a book right here, but, you know, I'm going to pull it up in a little bit, you know, show it to y'all, you know, what the world must know. So um, that's a little bit about myself. I'll turn it over to, to Nadine. Hi, everyone. And uh, uh, thank you for giving us this opportunity to come uh, on Black Power Media to uh, talk about Rwanda, to talk about those things that we never hear about in the mainstream media. But my name is Nadine Kazuba. Uh, and I was born and raised in Rwanda until I was, until I was uh, 13, uh, when the war broke out. Uh, so I left Rwanda, I went to live in Kenya. I lived in Kenya for four years, and then uh, I came in the U.S. as a refugee in 1999. So I pretty much finished my high school in the U.S., and then I went to college. Um, I, I'm currently working as a registered nurse. But I also have a, a degree in international studies. Um, um, on the top of that, I'm also a Rwandan activist. Um, uh, so yeah, that's my story. <laughs> no doubt, no doubt. Again, you know, welcome, and and I have a uh, a, a suspicion that you all will be uh, coming back soon on Black Power Media. We'll talk about that later on. But absolutely. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. But, Sounds like a plan. No doubt. I'm down, I'm down for it. Yeah. No doubt. No doubt. So um I wanna, you know, for folks who, you know, one of the things that that um I pride myself in in regards to Riot Starter TV is uh not taking for granted, you know, what people may know or not know. You know what I'm saying? Because oftentimes when we when we're activists and freedom fighters and so on and so forth, you know, we speak different language and, and terminology terms and so on and so forth and we use them so loosely that we think that everybody knows what's going on so what i would like to do is start off uh by getting a, a history of rwanda where it's at geographically and um what is the Rwanda rwanda you knew coming up as, as youth okay yeah i'll go ahead and uh, i'll start with that part of our geogra uh, geography and history of rwanda uh, so for those who don't know, Rwanda, it's a, an East African country, and it, it borders with uh, Uganda in the north, uh, Burundi in the south. Uh, there is Tanzania on the east side of Rwanda, uh, and then uh, Congo, Democ Democratic Republic of Congo on the west side of Rwanda. So uh, that's the geography of Rwanda. And then also the, we're going to talk about a little brief of history about the country of Rwanda, because it's important that we talk about history, because it kind of helps in understanding exactly uh, the roots of the conflict, uh, because uh, our conflict has something to do with the history uh, for the main part. So uh, the conflict is it's pretty much, we're going to talk about the ethnicities of Rwanda, the three ethnicities of Rwanda. So Rwanda has three ethnic groups, uh, Hutus, Twas and Tutsis. Uh, so the first inhabitants of Rwanda are believed to be Twas, and Twas are uh, hunter-gatherers uh, groups. And uh, Hutus, they came as a, a second inhabitants of Rwanda. And the history says that they came during the, uh, the Bantu migration, the great Bantu migration from the West Africa to towards the East and Southern. So Hutus are Bantus, and they came and they settled in Rwanda with the Tuas. Uh, Tuas is T-W-A. Uh, I bet some people probably haven't heard because when they talk about conflicts of Rwanda, they only mentioned Hutus and Tutsis. Right. But we have also Tuas. Um, so uh, the Hutus, they came, they settled in Rwanda. They, they, they started living with the Tuas. And by the way, the percentages of Hutus in Rwanda is 84% of the population. So they are the majority. And then Twas makes 1%. So uh, the third uh, ethnic group that came to live in Rwanda are Tutsis. So it's, uh, the history says that Tutsis came in Rwanda during the, uh, the 14th century. 
So Tutsis came from the northern, northeastern part of Rwanda along the Nile River, and they came and settled in Rwanda. So when they arrived in Rwanda, they found Hutus and Twas already living there in their communities. They had their structured govern, uh, system of governance. Um, they had their own kings and their own kingdom and stuff like that. So the Tutsis came and settled with them. Uh, and also they adapted the languages because they, they adapted the language that was being spoken. Because Rwanda, we speak a language called Kinyarwanda. And Kinyarwanda is believed to be, it's a Bantu language. Uh, and so Hutus, as they are Bantu, so they're the ones who pretty much spoke the Kinyarwanda. So Tutsis came and they lived together with the Hutus and Twas. There was, um, they, some of them married with each other. So there was intermarriages and all kinds of things. And then around 16th century, um, some Tutsis, uh, they, they managed to overthrow the kingdoms of Hutus that were already there. Uh, so they took over, uh, they established a kingdom of Tutsi. So Rwanda uh, was under rule of Tutsi kingdom for 400 years from uh, uh, around 16th, 17th centuries up to 1959 when there was a revolution. So during the time of the kingdom, uh, Hutus, uh, because Tutsis came and overthrew their kingdoms, Hutus were subjugated to uh, hard labor, slavery, and all, all kinds of injustices that uh, uh, was being done on Hutus, like through, during the whole uh, entire uh, monarchy of Tutsis in Rwanda. So also, during that time, during the monarchy period, I think you went a little bit fast, uh, just so that it, the audience knows the the kingdom was a monarchy. So it was just one family basically ruled the the country of Rwanda, Correct. you know, for hundreds of years. Keep going. Yeah, and the monarchy was Tutsi. So um, so again, the Hutus became second class. They were subjugated to hard labor and all kinds of injustices and stuff. Also during that time, like around 1899, uh, after the Berlin Conference, the Rwanda was colonized by the uh, Germans. So Germans were the first uh, European, was the first European country to colonize Rwanda. So when Germans came to Rwanda, they found the Tutsi kingdom already in place. Uh, they, didn't, they didn't overthrow the kingdom. They actually worked with the king and uh, the injustice that was already there, it kept going like as usual. They actually facilitated the king to keep doing whatever he was doing, uh, um, pretty much uh, uh, throwing all these injustices to Hutus like, like he was before. And then after World War II, uh, Rwanda was uh, given to Belgium. So uh, the Germans yes. left. Just uh, it's 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 World War One, not to World War One. I'm sorry. Making sure, yeah, yes. there we get that accurate. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Teamwork going here. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah, you know, <laughs> <laughs> it's a one-two punch. It's so lightning good. and thunder. Lightning and thunder. That's good. Yes, That's it's, good. A, it's after World War One. Uh, so German was defeated, and uh, Rwanda was given to Belgium. So the Belgium came. And they colonized, and uh, yeah, they kept working with the king. So nothing changed. Uh, Hutus uh, kept being subjugated to injustice and all kinds of hard labor, like all kinds of mistreatments. Uh, but even though during that time, even though all those stuff were going on, there were few, few of the missionaries, like European missionaries who came during the colonization who were kind of looking at what was happening and they'd be like, okay, this is too much. Like these Hutus really are, are having a hard time. You know, they're going through a lot. So some of them have uh, read and actually stuff about it. And then also it came by like during 1950. Yeah, there were a few groups of Hutus uh, who stood up and say, okay, enough is enough. Uh, we want equal treatments. We want to be a part of the kingdom governance. We want our children to attend schools, just like Tutsi's children attend schools, because uh, good schools were only allowed 
for Tutsis. Like Hutu children were not really allowed to attend good schools or get a better education like Tutsi children. So they started uh, raising awareness of what was happening. And, uh, and also that was coming with a, with, a, with a price because they were being uh, uh, harassed. They were being uh, threatened for what they were doing by the Tut their Tutsi mobs who harassed them. They would get beaten. Some of them even lost their lives. Hmm. But I will give also credit because during that movement, when the Hutus started raising awareness, there were like very few Tutsis who also sided with the Hutus. And they were like, yeah, these Hutus, uh, definitely, they deserve better. They deserve to be treated like Rwandans. They shouldn't be going through all of this. And, and some of the Tutsis were actually a part of the elites. So they were part of the uh, uh, kingdom uh, governance of, of, uh, of Tutsis. But they were brave enough to stood up and say, yeah, this is enough. You know, they, they really deserve better. But of course, the majority were Hutus who were demanding the equal rights. And, they were, uh, and, and then it came 1959. Tutsi mobs attacked one of the Hutu leaders who was also a part of the movement that was raising awareness. They attacked him, and that sparked the revolution of 1959. So um, uh, Hutus started revolting. They um, attack Tutsis, they burned their houses, they chased them out of the country, they abolished the, uh, the Tutsi monarchy. And also during that time, 1959, that was the time a lot of African countries were getting independence from the colonial rule. So Rwanda was also getting independence from the Belgium. So uh, they held some um, uh, democratic elections and Hutus won by the majority vote. So the first republic was created in 1962 and the, uh, the Tutsi kingdom was abolished. And so uh, a lot of Tutsi left. They went to neighboring countries to Uganda. Uganda was primarily uh, the first country that received the most of Tutsis. Some went to Tanzania, Congo, and Burundi. So, and then Rwanda became a republic and the first president was uh, a Hutu. His name is Gregoire Kaivanda. And then um, I'll hand it over to Claude Gatebuche. So that's pretty much a little bit history about Rwanda and uh, the root of the conflict. That, that so was Claude Gatebuche can tell us more about no, pre-genocide. <laughs> and that, that's cool because, uh, you know, that, that was a great history lesson going back, opposed to just saying it started right here in the 90s and that's just it. You know what I mean? So definitely we appreciate that. Claude, Claude got his mic on mute, I think. I was just practicing what I was going to say. Oh, okay. Uh, <laughs> uh, the, um, uh, uh, you know, that, that history lesson, I think, um, Nadine, you're going to have to start charging for being able to compress so much history in such little time. Man. But um, there's a couple of things I wanted to add. The, the treatment of Rwandans by the colonialists, which, you know, Rwanda is part of a region, the Great Lakes, Lakes, Lakes region of Africa. Initially, it was a German colony, as Nadine said. Uh, it was part of a colony with Tanzania, Burundi and Tanzania. Then when the Belgians lost the colonies, Rwanda became a colony of Belgium and, um, and um, um, Burundi also. And they were basically a part of, you know, there was the Belgian Congo, which, you know, was one of the most violent colonial, has one of the most violent colonial histories where, you know, the amputating of hands and, and feet, you know, started. And so the colonialists in, in Rwanda were also, they introduced an additional level of violence in terms of, you know, uh, the beatings of people for were not working but the other thing that they introduced that we're gonna get to see a little bit of this legacy of colonialism was you know the the ethnic groups that nadine talked about they were formalized they introduced a an identity card that actually showed you know this person is hutu and that person is tutsi and this person is twa which before that rwanda was you know being a an agricultural and and farming um community, they didn't have this kind of documentation. But fast forward, we'll get to see a little bit on, on that. Um, so Nadine stopped in uh, 
in the first, when Rwanda first became a republic and the very first president. During that time also, one thing that is to be noted and for historical record, um, in the 60s, Rwanda was at war. From 1960, I believe it was 62 to 67, the exiled Tutsis um, who fled Rwanda when the revolution took place and left with the king and everything, they were um, attacking Rwanda from various border posts or from various parts of, you know, of, of Rwanda. They didn't succeed at taking over. And initially, so many people have heard this term of Tutsis being referred to as cockroaches in the 90s, you know, during the genocide. <clears throat> but the initial use of this name was actually during these very first attacks. And this was not by the Rwandans inside of the country, but by the attacking rebels, they actually called themselves the Inyenzi is the word. It was an acronym. Um, the, the acronym was, you know, for, for a long sentence um in in or something like that which you know they they translated they they acronymed into inyenzi which in kenya rwanda is a cockroach mm. so for many years you know uh basically they were referred to that way and then of course um after that very first president of rwanda was well, the second it was it was technically the second president, but the first democratically elected president of Rwanda was actually ousted in a coup in the um, in the 70s. And if anybody, you know, for those of you who pay attention to African history, the 70s and the 80s, especially the 70s, were rife with um, coups by military leaders. Uh, Rwanda was no different. Rwanda uh, became um, um, a military dictatorship, a single party uh, state for more than 20 years. When the 20 years um, in 1990, so it was actually 17 years later, 1990, there was another attack on Rwanda. And the attack on Rwanda was by, remember in the 60s, the people who left with the king, you know, were attacking, but they never succeeded. This time it's the next generation. The next generation attacked. They had been a part of the Ugandan military. They basically left with equipment from the Ugandan military. They were equipped by the Ugandan military. Um, and, and we'll get into it a little bit later, but Rwanda, neither Rwanda nor Uganda is a manufacturer of weapons. Both are very poor countries. So this war itself actually had a big hand of the West in it. And we'll get into that. It was an imperial, uh, imperially supported war. Um, and so that's kind of the background leading up to the war. The war lasted four years. In those four, those four years culminated in what is known as the Rwandan genocide. So for four years, most people, when they hear about Rwanda, they know two things. Hotel Rwanda, the, the movie, or the genocide in Rwanda. And you would think that Rwanda started in 1994, but that's not the case. You know, Rwanda, as Nadine explained, is a country that's been around since the, the 14th, 15th, you know, uh, century, at least that we know of, it has been inhabited for that long. Right. Um, so the period from 1990, and I'm going to go, we're going to do the one-two punch, the, the, the lightning and thunder here. Nadine, uh, feel free to jump in you know um as we talk about that period yes, what i was trying to say it's not even the 14th century because 14th centuries that's one that's the time the first group of tutsis arrived in rwanda so rwanda has been there way longer nobody knows for how long because the first inhabitants being uh twice nobody knows it's just been there for like just like any other nation you had people that were created there and put there by god <laughs> Yeah. Real, real, real quick question. So the Twa, we were always taught that they were great astrologers. Is that is that a, a true statement? They are. Okay. Okay. They Listen. they are. They're 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 great at many things, in, including astrology, but also you know uh, they're great hunters. They're great you know gatherers, right. and also uh, they're very they 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 were they were good warriors. You know from 
you know, uh, the history books, they, they're, they're a type of people that if you had them in your uh, army and military, it was, you know, it was a good group to have. Um, but also, also, yeah, if I can sorry. finish this thought, they've been so oppressed by all of the subsequent, you know, various uh, leaders that that community is actually on the brink of extinction in Rwanda. Um, the, there is less than 30,000 twas in Rwanda. So this is, they're not even 1% of the population at this point. Nadine, go ahead. Yeah, that's one thing I, I wanted to add on. Uh, like back in the history, twas, uh, Hutus respected twas when it comes to, they used to say if, if there was like a lack of rain, because sometimes they'll have like dry seasons and there is no rain. So the first person you had to go to ask was that twa because they could actually do some kind of magical um, magical things and, and, and right? it will start <laughs> raining. Yeah. Right. Okay, okay. Yeah, no, that, those are things that we had heard, but you know what I'm saying? Like I said, you know, sometimes we don't know. Uh, you know, we, 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 we come up with um, all types of things. So, you know, I wanted to go to the to the source and see what uh, what you all had to say. You know, you all being... Uh, I know Claude's an expert in uh, in all types of things, so I wanted to go right to it. <laughs> I appreciate, but, um, it. I appreciate but, it. Nah, but um, you know, I, I wanted to uh, when we talk about the whole the, the genocide, right? So you're saying that the genocide was uh, uh, the war itself began four years before the actual genocide. Yep. How, how did that? Uh, how did it transition to that to that particular point? I think that's a really important and critical period to talk about. And again, Nadine, feel free to jump in here. But you know, to make it quick and summarize, you know, the, as as I said, the war started in Uganda. Um, it was an invasion by um, exiled Rwandans who were actually a part of the Ghana military, uh, top leadership of the Rwanda military. Uh, including Paul Kagame, who is now the president of Rwanda. Now, uh, Paul Kagame at the time was the chief of intelligence in Uganda in training in America at Fort Leavenworth when the war first started. So it wasn't until days later when uh, the initial leader, Fred Wigema, was assassinated or killed in the, in the war that he came and, and Kagame started leading this war. And there's a few things that that are to be that, that need to be known and said that are little known about what led up to the genocide, the brutality of this war. The rebels, known as the RPF, the Rwandan Patriotic Front, who are now the party in power in Rwanda, because they actually ended up winning that war four years later after the genocide. Basically, um, there was so much brutality in this war, they would call people to meetings hundreds of people to these meetings. So everybody watching this stream exponentially, and they would bring them together and they would surround them, throw grenades into the crowds, you know, kill people with, um, um, with hand weapons, things like hammers and uh, clubs and uh, small holes. There's actually a famous weapon that they use. It's called, um, um, it's, called, it's known as agafuni. Agafuni is the back of a hole that they used to bash people's heads in. Wow. And this, they were not discriminating on age or gender or anything like that. It just killed all kinds of people. Hundreds and thousands of people were killed. And what that led to, so the brutality of that war and the, the massacres by these rebels led to, and remember, the, the exiled uh, group was predominantly Tutsi. So the RPF was and still is a predominantly Tutsi party. They, um, that war led to a refugee crisis. In the space of three years, a million people in Rwanda fled their homes, became homeless, went to live in tent cities um, inside of Kigali. And if I can put it in perspective, there was 8 million people total in Rwanda. So 1 million is more than 10% of the population. So think of it this way. If you took America and got more than 30 million people 
to move in the space of three years from from one part of the country to one city doesn't matter what city it could be atlanta it could be new york it can be la it can be any city with the the most the greatest um uh infrastructure it will still be a big a big problem in that city i mean you know the groceries i mean we saw that during the pandemic last year i mean i'm sure nobody will find toilet paper then you know if you got that many people moving into one city at the same time that many people or if i can use a different analogy if you take every black person in america move them to one city at the same time there is what 41 42 million of us if you take if you take all of us and took us to one city in the space of three years that's what was happening in rwanda the, in addition to the refugee crisis there was weapons galore everywhere all over the country were these war weapons that were just like it was they were so widespread that for me as a child a preteen it was cheaper for me to buy a grenade than it was for me to buy a bottle of soda or a loaf of bread and so weapons started being used for normal crime like burglary and other you know um so people would just come with machine guns you know to to rob a a bar or wow. to rob a home you know they throw, throw grenades through windows and things like that and then there were terror attacks by the rebels in various parts so if again if we use like um you know if we use like public places think of places like a place like grand central station you know where you have so many people or court authority in new york or so many other places like um, a stadium if you think of a stadium um with thousands and thousands of people and they will start setting off explosives so on public transportation in markets in all kinds of places um in addition so that's not everything there was also assassination of politicians and every time a politician was assassinated the rebels blamed the government but it also led to riots and sometimes massacres um and also you know, I would, uh, yeah go ahead. yeah i would like to add in because during that time when uh, the war started in 90 like around towards the end of uh like uh, yeah actually right before um no it was after the war it was after the war in 90 where the rwandan government eventually decided to adopt a multi-party system so we came from one party system that was in place from 1973 and they accepted the open uh like the, we accepted democracy pretty much the rwandan government accepted the democracy so people started creating uh political parties and uh so during that time a lot of politicians who were being killed there were people from the opposition parties so the parties that doesn't speak the same language as the government as the the party on the power so every time those politicians were being killed the first blame will be the government of Rwanda the the, the that is that was currently that was uh running the country then so they will always uh, blame them because they will think, okay, they are, they are killing opposition leaders. But people will not even think about the rebels, what the rebels are doing, because they, they, they actually started um, sending the uh, informers, like in, the infiltrates, into the country so they can cause all those chaos, so that way the government can be blamed for all the crimes that are being committed. Yeah, so that's what I wanted to say claude go ahead yeah i think it's important the point that you raise those two points you uh, as i say the leading up to the war rwanda was a single party system and then the war started in 90 and then in 91 the um rwanda adopted a multi-party system which these parties now created their youth wings and the youth wings would have all these riots um and, you know, as kids, we didn't know that we would make it home, you know, when these riots were taking place in the streets. Now, what we've learned now since, there has been 
there were people from the RPF who had infiltrated every aspect of life in Rwanda, political and non-political, the okay. leadership and administrative, you know, uh, to every level. I mean, down to 10 houses in the neighborhood. And in that, um, and, and, and during that time, during that time, as they were, um, they had infiltrated um, the, uh, you know, the military, the political, but every single one, they were causing chaos, again, to make Rwanda so insecure that it, it was not a livable place. Now, um, we have heard testimony from those who had actually in, uh, infiltrated all of these various institutions in the various aspects of life. We have also heard from leaders today in Rwanda admitting and bragging that they actually had this. One of them being one of the top leaders of the RPF, his name is Tito Rutaremara, saying that they had infiltrated pretty much every sector of life inside of Rwanda. Um, so during that war, the four year war, there were multiple ceasefires. They were also violated by the rebels. Uh, there was also a peace deal, um, a, 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 um, a peace deal that was negotiated between the government and the rebels. And, you know, while all of this was happening, April 6, 1994, I'm sure April 6 means nothing to most people watching this, unless it's your birthday. But to Rwandans, it's a very important day because Rwandans born and unborn on that day, our lives changed. Hmm. Because that is the day that the um, RPF, uh, the Rwandan Patriotic Front, and this is according to their own um soldiers uh who you know have confessed to shooting down the plane carrying the rwandan and the burundian president who were coming from that peace you know the negotiate negotiating that peace deal and the ceasefire they were killed instantly and that's what sparked the genocide in 1994 and i want to stop here and, and 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 get you know nadim's additions here before you know, we get into the genocide and I'll share a little bit of my my story, you know, um, on how I survived the genocide. No doubt. Y'all making my job easy today. I just want y'all to know that because of the fact that, you know, you, 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 you it's it's not a question of you having to learn it. You know what I'm saying? Just uh, witnessing it is always, uh, you know, always takes it to where you need to go. But go ahead, Nadine. Let us let us. Uh, yeah so yeah and uh like like he said before like right before they shut down the presidential plan so the president was together with the president of burundi they were actually traveling in the same uh plane it was the rwandan uh president's private jet so they were coming from the tanzania in a city called arusha so arusha uh tanzania became the mediator of a peace deal between Rwandan government and the rebel, Tutsi rebels, the RPF. So while they were coming from the, one of the meetings that they had to have during that time, that's when uh, they shut down his uh, uh, presidential plan while he was landing uh, in the capital city of Kigali. And people may wonder how did that happen uh, if uh, the country was being run by him and then he gets shot while he was landing on on the capital in the capital city so during the peace deal like during the whole process of the peace deal they came a point where they agreed to join the forces the military the rebels and the rwandan military they had to mix for you know why the it was like a process towards the uh the peace deal so they they accepted to join the forces like the rebels mixing with the rwandan uh, military so during that time there was a deal that said the RPF is allowed to get uh, uh, to bring in a battalion of, of its own rebels, 600, at, I believe. They allowed them to come in the capital city of Kigali, and they gave them uh, the parliament house as, their, uh, as the, the place to live during the whole time the peace deal was going on. And apparently it was for them to be there and protect some of the authorities who are part of the peace deal that were living uh, in Kigali during the process. So they allowed them to come, but even though they were there, 
they had to be controlled. There had to be somebody making sure that they are following all the rules that are, are supposed to be go, going along with the peace deal. So the people who were responsible to do that, the, it was the United Nations, the UN peacekeepers that were in Rwanda, they were responsible to make sure that RIPF is following all, uh, all the rules, that their military is not committing crimes, their military is not um, doing other things that they're not supposed to do. And they had to do that to RIPF, and they also had to do that on Rwandan uh, troops, the, the governmental troops. But UN did not do its job, because all during that time, the 600 number of uh, uh, rebels that were housed in Kigali, uh, uh, apparently it was like more than double of They kept infiltrating more, more, more and more troops. Wow. So they, they, I mean, so they had to like, uh, they had something that they said they can't, they, they need to go bring the word like in this remote area of Rwanda. Uh, they said they couldn't use the word that was uh, found in Kigali. They just had to go fetch the wood um, in this remote area where they actually had a territory because during war they had occupied some territories of Rwanda. So they always requested, yeah, we have to go get the wood in that area. And every time they will go, they will bring more troops in. So if they, if, if it, if they go, like if it's only 10 rebels going to fetch the wood, they, they will bring more 10 uh, military with along with them and also they will bring in weapons sometimes they'll say they have the wood but underneath they have weapons so they kept infiltrating that way and when they shut down the presidential plane a part of the, the those troops that were housed in kigari they are the ones who shut down the presidential plane and i'm saying this because there have been a lot of investigations that have been conducted uh by uh by several uh experts and they always point out that RPF was responsible for shooting down the presidential plane. But most of the time, those investigations, they get stopped and people get threatened uh, to keep, uh, to carry, to actually show the public what, what exactly happened. Now, now they, Dan, uh, not, not only is it expert reports, but we also have testimony. I have personally spoken to uh, one of uh, Kagame's former uh, uh, guards, his name is Alois Rienzi. Alois Rienzi himself told me he was in a meeting at the end of March in 1994. So this is like a week, maybe a couple of weeks before, um, before uh, the shooting of the uh, plane. And one of the people in the meeting with Kagame and some of his high ranking officers, including, you know, one... Um, named um, Kayumba Nyamwasa. This man, who used to be a part of the intelligence in Rwanda prior, previously, uh, pulled out a map and showed them where they would shoot the plane. This is direct testimony. He's given this testimony publicly. He's given it in court, but I've also personally spoken to him and he's given me this testimony. There's also another uh, so former- quick, where, yeah. where is he located now? Is he in the United States? So where, where is this guy? No, he's located in Europe. Okay. He's in okay. Europe. Another one based in Europe, um, his name is James Nyandin, that was also a guard of uh, President Kagame. He is also given me his testimony and said Paul Kagame was responsible for the shooting of the plane. These are two of his guards. And then everybody else that's testified that's spoken about shooting the shooting of the plane was somebody that was associated with Kagame. Another one who was another another presidential guard was ready to testify about it in court. While he was in Kenya, he was snatched up. This was in 2015. He was snatched up and he was never seen again. So um, all of that to say, um, there is so many expert reports, but also so much um, testimony you know, to, to talk about, you know, the shooting of this plane. There's also a film by the BBC called uh, Untold Stories, Rwanda's Untold Stories that actually, you know, has so many of these former RPF people talking about the shooting of the plane and how it all went down. Nadine, sorry to cut you off, but I just wanted to add to the reports that there is also this testimony. Yeah. 
Yeah, so yeah, besides that, there was there is those testimonies, there is the investigation that being conducted, uh, and they all direct to show that RPF was responsible of shooting down the presidential plane. Uh, but uh, again, uh, all those infiltration also by the RPF were done while the peacekeepers of the United Nations were on the site, were in Rwanda, and were supposed to uh, control all those movements. But they never did it. So uh, uh, to the point where we, a lot of Rwandans feel like UN was a complice. Uh, they were favoring RPF. They had a plan to let them take over the country. So they shoot down the presidential plan. Everything escalated. Um, they started killing Tutsis. Um, they started, uh, and then the rebels got, uh, started fighting. And they actually started fighting right after they shut down the presidential plan. The war started immediately. Wow. Uh, they started shooting people. The Tutsis started dying. And then Hutus were also dying in the areas where the rebels were controlling or the areas where they sometimes they, they actually they will infiltrate. They will uh, mix together with the militias, the, the extremist uh, Hutus who are killing Tutsis. There were some Tutsis among those, actually, who were also... Uh, fueling the, the conflict, the killing Tutsis at the same time. Um, so everything became a chaos. Like um, the government was also like, it's like you chopped off the head of the government because if you shoot down the president and the president was not by himself, he was also with the, um, um, what was that? Uh, he was like the chief of the army of the Rwanda. Yeah, the military army. chief of staff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, military yeah. chief of staff. He died along. So it's, it's like you completely decapitated the head of the government. So they pretty much had to create uh, the new government uh, to, you know, to take care of the uh, escalated uh, um, situation that was going on. So, yeah, I mean, it became a chaos. Everybody was scared. Uh, nobody knew what was happening, but we, all we knew it was just that the war had started. People are dying. Uh, people are coming to your houses and they will kill you. And I mean, it became too uh, out of control. And it even seemed like the government itself, they didn't know what to do. Everything was completely out of control. Even during that time, the government requested ceasefire and the RPF refused. And, and guess what? During the, the Tutsis were dying and Hutus were dying, Rwandans were dying, but the rebels did not want any ceasefire. The objective hmm. was to take over the country. Yeah, so I'll give Claude Gatebuche, I'll hand over to you so you can uh, continue with their story. Yeah, um, the, um, actually, the, I, I wanna share what it was like from the eyes of a child, you know, when it happened. But some of the things that Nadine's talked about are, are really, um, you know, they're important details because be, be, because um, not only did the RPF refuse, um, it seems like maybe this, you know, this uh, live cast has gotten hacked, which is not unusual. You know, you're talking about Rwanda. Um, uh, that, that, that's wild because of the fact that I'm seeing in the chat folks saying it got cut off. Um, anyone, uh, <laughs> if folks can uh, hear us put in the chat that you're still on. Either way, we're recording it, so if we have to put it, take it down and put it back up, then we'll do that. Um, this is, uh, you know, just to, just to point out, you know, the, the, the serious nature of what it is we're dealing with here. You know what I'm saying? This isn't a, uh, it, it's not an entertainment situation, you know? So every now and then, you know, we get bumped off uh, and it's happened on several occasions. But if you guys are in the chat, it's I'm, here, I'm seeing this back up. Back no. up, yes, in the chat. Okay, cool, cool, yeah. cool. So, so uh, I think we probably should have said this at the beginning of the broadcast. It's all good. We rock. It's, Let's go. We always get hacked. Uh, mm -hmm. Every broadcast that we do mm -hmm. gets hacked. I've actually heard from uh, the the manager of the um, um, Afrobeat Radio. Uh, he's told me, and also a number of radio stations in various parts of. The world in jamaica in australia and they say every time we have you on we get hacked nadine knows this we have yeah. so many live casts that gets that get hacked so 
Uh, I brought the wrong people on. Huh? I suppose put, that's right. I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> don't be surprised if it happens. But uh, back to what we were saying here, um, it's important to note the RPF was not interested. Um, it's presented today as they they present themselves as having stopped the genocide, but in fact they were exploiting the genocide, participating in the genocide. Now we know that based on testimony and based on people who actually were a part of it. In addition to that, the RPF actually stopped the intervention to stop the fighting so that people's lives could be saved. So not only did they receive a, a, refuse a ceasefire, now I'm not saying I have all of this faith in the UN, but the RPF itself took the initiative, went to the UN and told um, and basically say they sent a letter on April 28th or 28th or 29th. Uh, I'm not sure the exact date, but it was either the 28th or the 29th of April 1994. This is three weeks, uh, three weeks after the genocide started and said, do not intervene because all the Tutsis that were to be killed have been killed and the genocide is over. You know, there's no point. There's nobody to save. Um, this letter was written by one Claude Dusaidi and Gerald Gahima. Gerald Gahima went on to become, uh, I believe he was a minister of justice, which I call it the Ministry of Injustice, the Minister of Injustice in Rwanda because of the things that they've done to the people, and also a, a prosecutor, uh, like the the um, the Attorney General, if you will, in, if we compare it to the U.S. or the top prosecutor in any other country. These are the people who basically say, no, do not stop the war. And it went on. Um, hundreds of thousands of people were killed. And from my eyes as a, as a child, when they told us that the president's plane had been shot, knowing everything that had happened, you know, leading up to it, especially with the assassinations of politicians, you know, I say to my mom and sisters, I was like, man, I hope the president didn't, didn't, didn't die because if he died, we're not going to be able to finish the soccer tournament. We were in the middle of a soccer tournament. And that's what I was worried about as a child. But that all turned quickly because, as Nadine described, shootings and bombings start, started. I mean, I would hear explosions on one side, you know, a, a boom sound. And then it would whistle over our heads. And boom, it would explode on the other side. And that, that was... Uh, it, it happened so often. We actually, um, we actually started like we got used to it. We were like, okay, the timing. Oh, there is the sound. Oh, there is the 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 whistle. Now the explosion. It felt like everything was crumbling around me. I was hearing people screaming and crying for help. Um, as Nadine said, you know, extremists Hutus started butchering Tutsis. We definitely lost the uh, stream. Um, online, um, they started butchering Tutsis, killing them with um, machetes and knives and all kinds of hand weapons, and it was total chaos. Um, I was, we went into hiding, myself and my mom and my two sisters, and we ended up basically, um, we, we were rescued from our home by some neighbors. Um, and we were afraid because people were in our house every night looking, searching for us and looking to kill us. We were sheltered by Hutu neighbors. Uh, we ended up escaping the city of Kigali, uh, you know, uh, again, rescued by uh, a Hutu man, a driver who put his life on the line and rescued so many people. And we kept getting stopped at so many checkpoints. They wanted to kill us and um, they would they would negotiate Ev at every one of those turns. Somebody would intervene, and if I can describe the scene in Kigali in Rwanda at the time, there was um, how can I put it? If you look at the sky, it was covered with a big dark mushroom, if you will. It was like all dark because of the smoke, the the burning structures. Um, the the dust from all of these structures being destroyed, 
the smell was so was so bad because of the decomposing human flesh mixed with gunpowder, mixed with smoke, mixed with dust. Uh, it was just like, you know, you couldn't, walking outside, you wanted to throw up. Um, so we fled, and at one point, me and my mother were pulled out of a truck and ordered to dig our own grave. And Kalonji, I believe this is a part of the story that you saw uh, where my sister was retelling the story. So their children, they saw us walk the way to go and be killed. But this driver did not give up and the neighbors didn't give up. People we don't know, they showed up and they came and they negotiated and they they just kept, you know, pushing and pushing and pushing. And eventually, I mean, uh, the driver came with these two men and the two men negotiated for us. One of the men said, don't kill this boy and his mom. Let somebody else kill them because they're not going to make it five miles from here. How, this how, was, how, how old were you at this time? Not, not 14. To cut you, you was 14. 14 years old and it's you yeah. and your mother and they're pretty much uh telling you to dig your own grave yeah they made us dig, dig our own grave and the neighbors some women all the men and some children rushed and started yelling at them and you know this is where it's important that everyone understands every voice matters every two feet matters you know uh it's gotta be you gotta speak up and do something because they distracted them long enough for the driver to come back, bring the negotiators who engaged them for hours and hours and hours. We got to this place, it was mid afternoon, it was pitch black when we left this place, when this man said the words, this boy and his mom are not gonna make it five miles from here, let somebody else kill them. And somehow they agreed to it. And we left, we ended up in a town uh, bordering the Congo and, and that's where we, um, that's that's where we stayed. So I just wanted to give a personal perspective and the eyes of a child on how I survived the the Rwandan genocide. And you know, every one of us has a story. Um, and if we went into it, we will go all day. But I just wanted to kind of share that so that you know the audience can can uh, kind of see it from somebody that was living it. The uh, rebels continue to bomb the country, right? Uh, like uh, crazy. Uh, uh, I, I want I want we I want to get to that, but um, you know, because of the fact that you know we're hearing you say about you know you, you're hearing the bombs, you you smelling the carnage, um, and I hate to use that word, but you know, you you are you're basically on the run, you know, you're with your mother and they're like, you know, dig your own grave, they're negotiating, so on and so forth. What was the the scenery like as you're traveling? You're seeing bodies everywhere i mean i, I i've seen pictures yeah. I, I don't know if people have seen this i've seen pictures in fact one of the the, the pictures that are used for the uh for the uh the youtube channel of skulls upon skulls and different types of bones and so on and so forth can, can you give you know and i don't i don't it, it's not to to seem graphic but i need people to understand what we're talking about here and it's not just it's not just the movie Hotel Rwanda. You understand what I'm saying? It's not a Hollywood depiction. Give us, take us to where you were at 14 and, and just traveling down the street. What was that like? You know what I'm saying? It's a couple of things. Um, the piling bodies on the side of the streets or in the woods was a recurring scene at the various checkpoints where we got stopped and they would point into the woods and show us that's where you're going to end up. And many times they would stop and basically say, you know, we're going to wait until we've gathered enough people to kill. That's one thing. Um, the other personal testimony, you know, um, after we fled our house, I actually went back because there was a, we needed to travel with my father's ID. And I went back home to go and retrieve the bag that had that ID. And I literally saw my next door neighbor chase down a a boy that I grew up with. Uh, I know you asked not to be graphic, but no, no, know, it's I, cool. I have to tell this picture. story. Yeah, yeah and, yeah. and then, and then, you know, that that will probably seal the deal, and we can continue. Okay. Um, but he chased this boy down. He was a little bit older than me. He chopped him to death with a machete in front of everybody. He turned to me. And when he came to kill me, one of the uh, the the guys who was there said, 
don't touch that boy. If you touch him, I'm gonna throw this grenade and it's gonna it's it's either gonna kill all of us or it's gonna cut everybody's legs off. And that's how I was spared. But I got to see that scene. Not that wasn't the only graphic or horror horror scene that I saw, but if you can just imagine body parts in various places, when the rebels would come at night to raid the neighborhood, they would also kill people and shoot people. And you would wake up in the morning and you find legs or arms, you know, body parts in different, you know, in the yard or, you know, um, on the street. So it was, it was just a horrible scene, horrible scene to see when it first started. And, and also I would like to add in, uh, uh, there is also uh, like that, whole story is happening in the area that is supposedly to be controlled by the government so mm. this mm. was mainly the time when the genocide against tutsis was happening so hutu militias and extremist hutus are killing tutsis but also there is uh, testimonies that have came out where we found out that actually during that time there were some infiltrates, the Tutsi rebel infiltrates, who were coming disguised as Hutu militias, and they would kill people, and then they would go back. And all that would be uh, attributed to the uh, Hutu militias and extremist Hutus who were, who were killing Tutsis. So it was a total mess. Yeah, and also, yes, uh, these militias that were killing, uh, killing uh, so many people and that threatening to kill us, uh, they, it was a mix, you know, some of them, uh, now we know that these were not just the extremist Hutus who were committing these massacres, but they were also uh, uh, Tutsi rebels mixed with them that were doing this, again, on testimony by either those who infiltrated or some of them um, um, were, you know, the leaders of the RPF have testified or bragged about this you know bragged about having those people involved um and also depending on what part of what was you know who 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 the area was under control massacres were being committed by the extremist hutus or the extremist Hutus in those rebels um you know i also have video testimony from some of the ones who were involved in what they called the cleaning group which that cleaning group within the rpf basically what they did was they would come after they took over an area and those were the ones who were in charge of committing the massacres i mean at some point they killed so many people that even when they got a day off and they said oh you know you're tired your arms are tired from hacking people to death you know um take two or three days off they mm -hmm. will bring them back a day later because they were like we are way too many people to kill that's how bad it was again um you said the clinging, the clinging group or cleaning? Clean, clean, like, you know, like wiping. Okay. You know, basically, okay. they were they were there to wipe out, um, um, you know, to wipe out whoever was left. Right. The parts occupied by the RPF were ghost towns. However, again, I don't want to lose sight of the fact that as the violence that we're describing here, we survived because so many people intervened and helped us survive. People spoke up, people intervened. And so when we describe this type of violence, uh, I know there's a tendency to look at us as Africans or as black people as just violent people, you know, for no reason. And that is not true. There, you know, these are groups that were trained and also had an objective to actually do the killing because they because of their own selfish reasons. Um, and on top of that, they were sponsored by the uh, uh, Western imperialists. So all of this needs to be in the context of this isn't just Africans killing Africans. This is Africans killing Africans with the sponsorship of the West. And, and, and that actually happens even later because we end up fleeing into the Congo because the rebels took over. You know, the RPF took over Rwanda. They bombed everything. Every goat, every chicken, every person, every baby, every old woman and man, um, you know, in their in their way, they killed, they they shot, they 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 bombed, and so we were pushed into the Congo. We were met with disease and disaster. I would and... like I would like to add on something. Yeah. The RPF rebels, the RPF soldiers, the Tutsi rebels, 
they have this term called kufagia, which means they it's a Swahili word that means word that means uh, um, a high core. Like pretty much I mean, right? is wipe everything, you know. Mm -hmm. Like yeah, like you, we have kufagia. They, 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 everywhere they have to go, they have to wipe out, like wipe out everything. Yeah, so which means kill everybody, babies, uh, moms, men, yeah. everything. It's uh, like sweeping, like right. wiping or sweeping. Right. Yeah. I want. I want to. I mean, so, it, 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 there's so much to uh, unpack. I definitely want to deal with the history of uh, Paul Kagame, but at the same time, I want to talk about, uh, because you all mentioned massacres, and I know that there was a, um, a situation at, what is that, the uh, Bayumba Stadium? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, can, can, can you talk about that because of the fact that, again, I'm, I'm just trying to yeah. paint this picture of what we're what we dealing with here. Um, the Bayumba Massacre, the stadium massacre, actually also is one of the largest massacres that happened in one place in 94. Um, it was, uh, Biomba was one of the first places occupied in, um, in, um, by, the, by the RPF for those four years. And during that time, they basically gathered as many people as they can. They filled the stadium, surrounded the stadium, and then they pretty much killed everybody in that stadium. This is to give a picture of, you know, what actually happened to people in those areas. Why I was saying that the, I'm glad you brought it up because the Bimba massacre basically actually does show the, why the areas controlled by the RPF were uh, ghost towns. They, they, were, they were massacring. Whoever didn't flee, like the million people who fled, they, they killed them. Some people did get saved. Now, no doubt, there were people who were saved by the RPF, but it was usually in a discriminatory manner. They would select people by ethnicity and and usually save the Tutsis and kill the Hutus and Tuas. Um, but at the Bumba Massacre Stadium, uh, at the Bumba Stadium Massacre, they they packed it up with people. And, and also, I would like to mention that with the Bumba Massacre. There were there was uh, one of the largest displaced people's camp that was in Kigali. It was like in an outcast of this uh, outskirts of the city of Kigali. So that refugee camp when RPF attacked, uh, so it, it was pretty much uh, also close to the Biumba area. So what when they attacked, some of the refugees were directed to go back to go to Biumba area. And also some people who were being uh, caught in the, in the middle, because sometimes the RPF will just attack and they will take over the, uh, the area. And by the time you wake up in the morning, they are already there. They occupy the area. So some people got moved to go to Byumba. Like most of the people were being moved to go to Byumba to, you know, they didn't know what, what was going to happen. They didn't know that they were going there to be killed. Because most of the time they would say, I... Everybody has to go to Biumba, and then uh, after Biumba, people can start going back to their homes. But so yeah, one of those refugees, like a lot of refugees that were in the particular camp, those who did not die, they were pushed to go to Biumba. And of course, some ended up in Biumba Stadium. Go ahead, Claude. Yeah, so yeah, that's pretty much, and in in the, if I, we can give a reference, there's a book called uh, In Praise of Blood by Judy River, an investigative journalist from Canada that, you know, um, based her book on 20 years of research, but also testimony of survivors and actually perpetrators and so many of the, the people involved, that this book, it's called In Praise of Blood, The Crimes of the RPF. Again, In Praise of Blood by Judy River. If you can check that book out, it actually has, you know, a lot of this uh, history, including this Bumba massacre, uh, and a lot of, you know, what actually happened in the Congo and to the Congolese people. We're gonna get a book list and film list of uh, required uh, reading and viewing from you guys. All so, right. um, you know, for folks that's interested in that, you know, look out for it on on a Twitter feed. Um, and if it's 
if, and if it's a lot of books, like we we suspect, we'll put it in the uh, in the description of the video. Um, I know that a few folks have complained that they had to refresh uh, several times. Don't worry about it. We're recording it. So if in the event that any funny business takes place, we'll repost it. Don't even trip. Um, but uh, I want to talk about, uh, you know, th this guy that, that so many folks are talking about is a great man. He's a Pan-Africanist, so on and so forth. I, I want to talk about his history because one of the things that uh, that you pointed out was the fact that he was trained at Levensworth. Now, if you were trained at Leavenworth, I mean, if you know anything about anything, you got to be one ruthless ass trader. So I, I would really like you to, um, you know, let's talk about Paul Kagame. What, like, like, who is this guy? What's his history? I, yeah, I can start with that part. Uh, so, like, pretty much, if you look back what we just said, how his, uh, the army that he was leading, how he was massacring people, there is no way you can say, okay, this guy stopped genocide. I mean, you came massacring people. You, uh, the people that you were supposed to save, you are killing them. You know, there is no way you can actually say that you stopped the genocide. And that's one thing he gets credit for. He gets a credit saying that he has stopped the genocide. No, he hasn't. Because also that's some stuff we'll be talking about. Yeah, because... Uh, the, it looks like genocide continued in Rwanda, but in a different manner. Right. Um, so besides that also, um, yeah, he has all these credits. Like we also have to check out who is saying, the, who is uh, uh, putting this propaganda out there. The, the media that is propagand that is putting out these uh, statements about Kagame being the most progressive leader of Africa, uh, being the, the savior of Rwanda and everything. We have to check that information and, and we always have to question ourselves when we see the people who actually helped him to get on the, uh, to take over the country are the ones who put that information out there and they leave all that history behind of how he has been butchering people. So he's not a Pan-Africanist because a Pan-Africanist wants they, uh, uh, they want their people to unite. They want their people to, uh, to progress. And they don't want their people to be uh, killed and, and be massacred like that. Yeah, also we have to look after he took over the country, what happened? There was a lot of uh, imprisonment. Like, uh, and it was, um, uh, the people were being put in prison the majority of them are from the Hutu ethnicity. So there was a lot of segregation, a lot of, uh, 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 like, like, like pretty much, like Claude mentioned how they have a lot, like he's been saved by a lot of Hutus, like a lot of neighbors who are Hutu, they, they help them escape, they help them, you know, they save their lives. Some of those Hutu ended up in prison when Kagame took over the country, a lot of them. And what they do, they smear uh, crimes on you. They say, oh yeah, you participated in genocide. They put you in jail. You will stay in jail for years without trial. And some of them are still in there. Uh, most of them have died in the prison. And uh, there are some horrific pictures. You can see how the prison life was back then. It was, it was scary. People were having gangrene. People were uh, dying of hunger. I mean, like a lot of crazy, um, stuff that were going on. The prisons were packed. People could not even find a place to sleep. They, they had to stand up all the time. Um, so all that stuff happened. There were a lot of uh, injustice, like of putting people in prison. Even, even young children, like teens, teenagers, they were put in prison. And then besides that, after he took over the country also, uh, there, there were a lot of killings. Um, like in 1996, 1997, uh, there were actually a lot of killings uh, when he attacked Congo because some of the refugees were killed in Congo, a lot of them. Uh, some, they, they kept walking the equatorial forest. Some of them are still in there. We still have refugees. We still have Rwandan refugees in equatorial forest of Congo that have been actually denied the rights of being a refugee by United Nations. They don't get any help from the United Nations. They've just adapted to live a forest life. Um, and then they are also a part of those refugees who are forced 
they, they've been pushed to go back to Rwanda by force. And what ended up happening to those refugees, uh, most of them have been killed. They will call them for meetings. Like this is another thing our uh, Kagame troops do. They will call them for meetings. Uh, and once everybody's gathered, you have like 100 people coming for the meetings. They will throw grenades and bombs and they will kill those, those, those refugees. And then they will put them in mass graves. And then sometimes they don't use the mass graves because they know the mass graves can be an indication of uh, evidence. They burn the bodies. Uh, there were also several reports how they used to take the bodies in a... The, we have this area called Akajera. So they would take the bodies there. They would use gasoline and, and uh, acid to burn the bodies so that nobody find any evidence. All this stuff are the stuff that happened after Kagame took over the country. Uh, and then besides that, there is imprisonment. Like there is a completely lack of the freedom of speech, uh, like imprisonment of journalists uh, or any ordinary people who happen to uh, come out and start speaking up. Um, yeah, we, we have several names we can mention. Yeah, Nadine, I, I want to uh, add to what you're saying about Kagame and him being a Pan-Africanist. I know the question was, is he a Pan-Africanist? Before I even get into why he isn't, I know the other question was, um, who is he? You know, if I can just use an analogy of um, black history, you know, what we have today is an exploitation of Africa, and especially that area, um, the Great Lakes region of Africa. The Congo is the richest country in the world in terms of natural resources with 24 trillion, T, trillion dollars worth of um, minerals and natural resources. It's a country that has the potential to supply all of Africa with electricity that could feed the whole continent of Africa with its agricultural potential. It can, so it can provide food security, electricity, and a lot of the basics. And then it has all of these other natural resources, including the equatorial forest com comparable to the, um, the Amazon. It's the second largest to the Amazon. The Congo River is second largest to the Amazon. Um, but what Kagame has done with the exploitation of the Congo has been basically um, the local sellout, the supporter. So let me go to our black history. During the slave trade, we, the people, were the resources that the um, the Western uh, multinationals were plundering and stealing out of off of the continent. When this was happening, corporations were doing this, taking our people from the continent to the Americas for profit. Governments were covering up for them with laws and support and diplomatic cover. And the local sellouts were facilitating and helping these Western multinationals to sell our people to these Western nations. There's nobody at this point. I'm 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 I'm, I'm pretty sure there's very little number of people today who would say, "Oh, if slavery was happening today, I would support it." Uh, in mm -hmm. terms of the trade, slave trade, or um, you know, everybody wants to distance it, distance themselves from it because it's in the past. But what's happening in the present is exactly what was happening at that time. And Paul Kagame is one of those local sellouts like, you know, Yoweri Museveni of Uganda because Rwanda is not rich in natural resources. The question was actually asked in the chat earlier. You know, what are, the, what are Rwanda's uh, biggest natural resources? One is the people. Rwanda is the most, one of the second most densely populated country in the in the world. So it has the largest number of people per square mile or per square meter in the world, uh, the second in the world. So it has a lot of people. That's natural resources. It has a lot of coffee and tea. It has limited coltan and considerites uh, and other minerals. But the Congo next door has all of it. And what Kagame has done is strike the deal with Western multinationals and Western governments to give them an entry into the Congo 
and also Rwanda serves as a transit point for resources stolen out of the Congo and taken to the world market. That's one thing, one of the things that Kagame does. That's who he is. Again, this again, demonstrating how he's not a Pan-African because a Pan-African does not exploit Africa, does not exploit Africans. We haven't talked about the millions of Congolese people who've been killed by his troops, but I'm getting there. Rwanda is a supplier of troops where Western countries are not willing to go. So since the American troops getting killed in Somalia in 1993, the U.S. doesn't send their troops in many, many places. I mean, they've sent them to, to, to Iraq and, you know, Afghanistan. They don't do it openly. Rwanda is basically the hired mercenary. And a lot of times it's done under the cover of UN peacekeeping missions. Rwanda was in Darfur. Rwanda had peacekeepers in Haiti. Peacekeepers, in quotes. Um, the leader of the peacekeepers, UN peacekeepers in Mali was a Rwandan general wanted for war crimes and crimes against humanity and, and, and genocide, who is a part of Kagame's uh, uh, leaders, uh, General Jambos Kokazura. He said he's the leader of what? The UN what now? What, he, what he, he was. He's, he's no longer there, but he was hired as a UN missions leader to Mali when Mali uh, had uh, uh, UN peace troop, uh, peacekeeping uh, troops. In Central African Republic, Rwanda has troops there. Today, Rwanda has troops in Mozambique. So when I say the global African is affected by Kagame, we're talking about the continent of Africa from Southern Africa in Mozambique to Central Africa in the Central African Republic to the invasion of the Congo to the tune that's killed millions, six million people in the Congo to North Africa in, in Darfur to West Africa in Mali and to the diaspora in Haiti. That is what Kagame is. He's an agent of the West. He is a um, he's a puppet of the U.S. and the U.K. and the in the European Union. That is who he is. Um, he does, you know, from time to time, lash out at the West when they have disagreements, and that excites a lot of um, Africans and, and people of African descent, thinking that he's actually a progressive and and a Pan African leader. But when you look and at his record toward Africans, he is nowhere. Nowhere near. And also, I would like to say, like, when he complains about the West, sometimes I think it's a game. It's a game to keep uh, the, uh, his, his supporters around him. Uh, and he knows a lot of Africans, they want that. They want somebody who can stand up against the West. So he has a lot of tricks. He can say stuff like that so that he can keep people around. But we, we should never go by the words. We should always go by the actions because what he says sometimes uh, uh, about the West is totally different by what he does. It's totally different from his own actions. So, yeah, go ahead, Claude. So, so I mean, that, that kind of answers the question. But then I really want to, you cannot talk about Rwanda without talking about the invasion of the Congo and how Rwanda and Uganda invaded the Congo for the last 25 years. It started in 1996 to this day. Congolese people are being killed and Kagame has not been held accountable and why do you think that is if he did not have the cover of the western countries you know for example there was a release of a report called the UN mapping report um the UN mapping report was released in 2010 and guess who blocked it from being released it was the the U.S. mission to the U.N., which was under the Obama administration, the first black president. The ambassador to the U.N. was a black woman, Susan Rice. She blocked it because at one point she um, she worked for a lobbying firm that lobbies for Paul Kagame. In addition, by the way, you know, so speaking of, um, you know, this this is podcast you know, is aired out of Atlanta. Let's talk about Atlanta, the former mayor of Atlanta, the former U.S. ambassador to the U.N., and a veteran of the civil rights 
movement. Anybody, do you want to guess? Andy Young. There you go. Andy yeah. Young. Yes, yes. Andrew Young's farm. I have uh, invoices of that firm. Uh, Good Works International was the name of the firm. Was a lobbyist for Paul Kagame. Andy Young is one of the people who actually are friends, personal friends or, or friends with Kagame, provides cover for Kagame. Susan mm -hmm. Rice, Bill Clinton, Tony Blair of the UK, um, Rick Warren, uh, Paul Farmer of, um, I forget what it's called, uh, something international, Lee at the World Bank, um, the Bill Gates Foundation. Paul Kagame has these friends and that is who he is and he's also like well uh well known in the circles of um the academia in places like he's been invited to speak at harvard and yale in various places um and whenever his record comes out or whenever he's creating chaos somebody will show up usually bill clinton or somebody um and try and start to speak up on his behalf so Everybody I named there, like I said, I have invoices from Good Works International doing work, Good Works, in, a veteran of the civil rights movement. So Kagame is also not only not a Pan-Africanist, a mass murderer and a genocide there, but also a puppet of the West, but also a con artist. Um, I'm not sure what An uh, Andrew Young's, for example, I mean, this is a person, when we look at MLK's pictures, you know, we see Andrew Young, you know, standing next to him. But Listen. then he turns around and, you know, he is a supporter of Paul Kagame, who has killed millions of, uh, of people. So he's a complex character, if I can put it that way. But again, we must always keep in perspective the, um, the massacre and the genocide of the six million Congolese people. And there's been no justice. And you think about Robert Mugabe, who started getting in trouble when he started repossessing lands from white colonial settlers in Zimbabwe. Had he been, uh, had he killed millions of people and not touched white people's lands, he would still, he would still be around. So be Kagame, good. again, cannot fool anybody about being a Pan-Africanist. Um, and I just want to stop there so that I don't hog the whole time. <laughs> No, it, it's all good. I don't know why you threw me under the bus talking about Atlanta. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> nah, I mean we 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 know that you can't um, you can't uh, be in certain positions if you're not bought and sold. So we we clear about uh, Dandy Andy and 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 the rest of these characters. Uh, you know, and and we you know we we get caught up in in what the uh, you know well this guy marched with that one and so on and so forth. I mean, you know, there was like you all talked about earlier about the provocateurs and the infiltrators that existed within uh, Rwanda. I mean, it, it's like that throughout. Th that's the American fabric. Thank you. Know you. I'm saying? It's, it's Thank interwoven you. and we can't be fooled. We're not we're not, um, you know, as, as one of our OGs would say, we're not um, uh, into black faces in high places. You understand what I'm saying? We're not caught up in the personality. You know what I'm saying? A piece of shit is a piece of shit, no matter how you dress it up. Yeah, you can put a bow tie on it, a necktie, you know what I'm saying? A, a come up on put perfume on it. Whatever it's still gonna smell like shit. No deodorant. You know? yep. <laughs> it's still gonna be what it is. So we're clear. And we know that, you know, we know that it, that Andy and the rest of them, you know, they're not confused. They're not, you know, you can't, you know, there's no uh uh you know ignorance here, you know, it, they're clear about what's what. And the fact is, unfortunately, because we are such a divided people, it is easy because of the fact that, you know, the attitude, well, it's not my people. You understand what I'm saying? It's like, what have they done for us? You know what I'm saying? That's that's the number one trick of the trade right there. You know what I'm saying? They just, you know, the divide and conquer. Let's say, okay, well, you know, they don't look like you and they think you're stupid and you don't look like them and so on and so forth. And, and we get confused and used, uh, but you know we're, we're quite clear. That is proof that all skin folk and kin folk, right? Man, look here, man. So you rapping now? Claude <laughs> in the building, act like y'all know. <laughs> you, bought, you bought Nadine just in case. That's right. That's right. Running shotgun. It's anyway, a, it's a one-two punch. Yes, you know, the yes, lightning yes. and thunder. 
<laughs> yes, yes, yes. I, I want to, um, I mean, it, and, and we, we've covered uh, a lot, but not enough. You know what I'm saying? You know, we're, we're, we're still rolling. Um, and, and to the folks in the chat, you know, please share this. This is a, this is one of the most important pieces that we've done in this platform because of the fact that, you know, we, we're talking about things in real time. A lot of times we talk about what happened in the past as if, you know, it's not happening anymore. You know what I'm saying? They got Paul Kagami walking around like uh, with the with the Abraham Lincoln syndrome. You know what I'm saying? I freed the slaves. You know what I mean? And we, in reality, we know that it's uh, you know it's it's all bullshit, and it's all uh, sponsored by the same uh, by the same corporation. You know uh, that being the U.S., the French, you know the Belgians, the West, and as a whole. Um, I want to, um, you know, one of the things that you all spoke about was the fact that you know the um there are people who are still suffering for speaking out against what's going on and we are quite clear that claude and nadine couldn't rock what they couldn't talk about what they're talking about if they were in the congo if they were in rwanda if they were in uganda or anywhere in that region and in many other parts of uh the, the diaspora as a whole and <laughs> probably places in the United States, to be quite honest with you. You know, uh, let's talk about some of these folks who are, 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 are disappeared and who have been kidnapped and who you spoke about one particular brother in 2015 that, uh, you know, he vanished. I mean, how, you know, is this a, a regular thing or is this, you know, let's talk about that. Yeah, actually, uh, yeah, that was my brother, my own blood brother mm. um, Nadine, no no he's talking about the uh the um the bodyguard that i talked about who who sent the um uh, the testimony the video testimony about oh. the shooting of the yeah the, but let's the, let's, the yeah. But let's talk about your brother yeah let's definitely you know, talk about yeah because uh, he mentioned yeah. he mentioned 2015 for some reason uh uh i thought that he that that is the person that he was talking about because we mentioned him like in the last video that we did me and you right 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 right, on right, HMG. right. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, my brother vanished in 2015. Uh, my brother was one of the uh, strong Rwandan activists, advocate against Paul Kagame's uh, way of doing things. Um, but also, one thing people have to know is that uh, Kagame has intelligence everywhere, worldwide. And uh, he also have uh, people that he sends to target the refugees, to target the activists. And to, sometimes uh, they, they kill you on the spot or they, they, the other method they use, they, um, they kidnap. So my brother went to Kenya thinking that he was actually meeting some of the activists that he was supposed to have a meeting with. He left the United States, went to Kenya, and we never heard from him. And he disappeared along with other two uh, Wandan activists that he was with. Yeah, so uh, what, that's one thing, like as Rwandan activists, we always have to be careful. We just don't go anywhere. Like we don't have freedom to go anywhere, like regular he, people. He was coming from the United States, you said too, Kenya? Correct. Yeah. Yeah. So he was coming from the United States, going to Kenya, thinking that the people that he was in communication with, they, they were on the same page. They were activists like he was. But indeed, they were uh, fake activists. Uh, who were actually working for Paul Kagame. And uh, so they kidnapped him and he vanished. Like, and we still cannot find any traces. This goes back to, we talked about the infiltration. This game of infiltrating has been going on with the RPF for a long time. And the way they do it, they will bring somebody to, to, to eat, drink, talk, walk, and, you know, I mean do everything like you and look like he's basically, you know, uh, a clone of you. Uh, basically all of that, you know, uh, I'm just using a metaphor to show they will bring people so that they can establish trust, make it look like you're with them or they're with you. And those people are the ones who will facilitate actually you getting killed or, um, or disappeared. Um, many times, there's red flags. We actually now, you know, like we can recognize where those red flags are. When we see them, you know, some people, they ignore them. Uh, and some people, 
you know, take them seriously. There's usually something that will show you that this person is foul. And if you just pay no attention or you just think, you know, well, I'm okay. I'm just going to, you know, you know, keep doing what I do and do it, you know, however I want, it'll get you in trouble. So I wrote an article last year um, in the Black Star News, and I talked about how Rwanda has such a, an extensive surveillance system using humans, using human beings, that it's more sophisticated than the, uh, the NSA surveillance uh, tools. Um, and, and I was half joking because literally, you know, inside of Rwanda itself, every 10 homes are actually monitored you know, by somebody within the RPF. So the things that are happening now in Rwanda, if I can just summarize, like highlight the things that they happen. You know, we talk about disappearances like the Dean's brother or the brother that I talked about earlier that was uh, gonna testify about the shooting of the plane and so many others, hundreds of others. There is enforced disappearance where actually members of the security forces will grab you and snatch you off the street and take you away. This happens mostly to street vendors and street children. So when we talk about Kigali being a clean city, it's cleaned by removing the people, sending them to camps or taking them to torture tank chambers and many times never to be seen again. People of our generation, there is a study that showed that six, nearly 600,000 people born between the year 1979 and 2007, in a period of just 10 years, between 2005 and 2016, nearly 600,000 people disappeared. They cannot be found. The other thing is wait, that wait, if wait, you're wait, a journalist... Wait, 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 wait. Yes, you it's a genocide. Said, I just described the genocide. You said between what born year and what year? Between 79 and 2007, the period of 28 years. So a whole generation between so, 79 and 2007 born in that period have disappeared and we cannot find a trace of nearly 600,000 of those people. And that's only people who disappeared in the years between 2005 and 2016. So we're not talking about people after 2016. We're not talking about people before 2005, just in that period. Yes, I just described a genocide of a generation. So you're talking about a genocide after a genocide. You know, yes. you're talking about, I mean, you're saying over a half a million people just straight missing. I mean, just like vanished. See, and now I know you're paying attention because oh yeah, that's not that a life. small statistics. Yes. It's really small. And also, short amount that, of time. that's what I was mentioning that when people think that Paul Kagame stopped the genocide, no. He did not stop the genocide. He actually continued the genocide that he had started in 1990. But he keeps changing the methods of conducting that genocide. But the genocide goes on in Rwanda. Uh, the other things I wanted to highlight is the journalist. Like anybody, you know, if you speak out. So we're talking about the ordinary people. Those 600,000 people, we don't know them. Some of them we know. These are like family members, friends, and many other people that we don't know. Obviously, 600,000 people is a lot of people. Um, but there's the disappearances. There is the, um, the arbitrary arrests and holding people in, in pre-trial detention forever. Sometimes, you know, for years and years. Um, there is uh, people who speak out. I mean, there is a lady, for example, her name is uh, Yvonne Idamangi. She opened a YouTube channel. The YouTube channel lasted literally, literally two weeks. Hmm. And she was thrown in jail. And in this September, she was, she was sentenced to 15 years in prison for speaking out on a, on a YouTube channel. Um, you know, we talk about artists, you know, people like Amable Karasira, who lost his whole family to the RPF you know, um, after surviving the genocide, he goes out and he starts telling his story. And, you know, he talks about some of the things that are wrong in Rwanda. First, they make him, they harass the university that he worked at. He loses his job. And now he's in, in jail, been, in, been jailed for four months now, for six months, almost seven, 
with no trial. Um, no one knows, actually no one has seen him in public. Um, I'm just giving highlights, you know, right. um, but, but those are some of the big, the big highlights. People are punished for speech. People are assassinated in, in prison. I mean, they shoot prisoners with handcuffs on and shackled and say that they were trying to escape. How does somebody try to escape a jail with their feet tied and their hands tied? Um, and so all of that, um, just to, to show the picture of the, when we see the Rwanda that we are shown in the media, it's, it's basically the rosy picture painted by the supporters, the Western supporters of Rwanda. And when we look at the reality, um, Rwandans themselves are suffering. Um, and this is affecting us, the global African, every one of us that cares about an, a person of African descent is affected when an injustice happens to somebody, to one of our sisters and brothers. And again, I wanna make sure that it's understood. Paul Kagame is a puppet of the West. The things that he does is with the support of the West, diplomatically, militarily, um, financially, and in so many different ways. So let's not get it twisted. Let's get it straight. Uh, Paul Kagame is a hired gun. He is a mercenary for the West, and 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 you know he carries out all these killings and everything. Let that not be a reflection on us. That's why we take a stand. That's why we speak up and speak out and make sure. Because I personally know from my own experience that speaking up and speaking out actually does save lives. Um, yeah. But and I just also, want to make sure that that is uh, out there. And also, I would like to add on something that besides him, like we, he initially was targeting Hutus. Uh, now, Paul Kagame targets anybody. There, there's a lot of Tutsis who are also facing the same kind of injustice. Even so, some of them have helped him take, take the power. There are some uh, rich Tutsis businessmen who contributed uh, in uh, raising money for the RPF to attack Rwanda. Some of them, he's already turning against them, maybe because they don't agree on some stuff or uh, or maybe because they start they finally seeing the guy they supported is not the guy they thought that he was but even there is a lot of tutsis who are also facing injustice so it's not only hutus right now anybody who speaks against rwandan government uh gets in trouble uh gets killed gets imprisoned or uh gets um, all kinds of um harassment yeah. even people who like actually financed his war with their money, you know, he's turned around and killed him. So, um, again, this isn't a simple Paul Kagame thing. We, this is a part of the larger white supremacy around the world, you know, and Paul Kagame is just an agent of that. Let me ask. Um, I know that right now we know it's a, a lot of unref, un, unrest in uh, Ethiopia. You have the TPLF. And uh, of course, in uh, Rwanda, you have the um, uh, RPF. What are the similarities? Because it, it seems to be kind of. Uh, <laughs> it, 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 it seems like. <laughs> let's, let's talk about some identical twins. Now, then you want to go first? <laughs> yeah, that, that, that's yeah, what I'm actually, thinking. I'm like, I would, I would, I would like to say that that's one thing that caught my attention when they. Before Ethiopian conflict started, uh, I was like, okay, what is going on? Because what I started noticing was that, okay, the guy who just got a, a Nobel uh, Peace Prize, now he's becoming a genocidaire. Now he's, you know, they're painting, they're smearing all these things on him. I'm like, okay, he's prime minister and this rebel is like causing chaos and everything. So I started following and their story is exactly, it kind of matches exactly the Rwandan story. So TPLF and RPF are exactly the same. They use violence. Yeah, they both uh, massacre people and then, um, and then they, they play victims. And that's exactly what RPF do. They know how to kill and then they'll play victim. And then also in Ethiopia, in Rwanda, there is a genocide. The genocide has become a tool in Rwanda. Like, if, like me and Claude or any activist who starts speaking up, we 
automatically labeled a geno genocide denier. Mm -hmm. You know, it, they they label a genocide denier. If uh, sometimes if you if you was too young, because they can't say you killed people because we were too young when all that happened. Right. They'll go after your parents. They'll go after uh, somebody in your family. They'll start smearing lies. You know, saying that they are genocidal. So. They, they use genocide as a tool to attack anybody who speaks against them. And that's the same thing TPLF was saying. They were saying how the, uh, gov they were uh, saying the government of Ethiopia is killing uh, Tigrayans. Um, so, and that, that, that is a lie, you know, because as the Ethiopians are showing what is happening on the ground without relying the information to... Uh, uh, to, to, to what the mainstream media is talking about, we are kind of noticing that uh, all those are lies, you know, because even in Rwanda, uh, even in the court, they haven't found any evidence that showed that there was a long plan by the Rwandan government to start the genocide. Um, so they both use genocide as a tool to silence anybody who goes against them. They, all, they both start, uh, use the violence um, uh, against their own people. Uh, they're both supported by the, uh, the Western media. They are supported by the, um, by the uh, Western corporations, the United States, UK. Uh, so there is a lot of similarities. Uh, and both, like when Ethiopia was being led by the uh, TPLF, and uh, they all had like good ratings. Yeah, Ethiopia was, uh, the economy yeah. was great. In Rwanda right now, economy is great. It's the most progressing country. So it's, a, it's, it's just a game, like it's a Western game of how they use it uh, to um, put the people they want in place in, in countries of Africa. So there is some similarities and Claude can add on if he wants yeah, to. For sure. TPLF and RPF are like copy paste. I'm so glad that people are now waking up to the TPLF and hopefully even our Rwandan, uh, uh, for, for you know our uh, fellow Rwandans are following because for many years I've been saying watch Ethiopia, look what's happening in Ethiopia is exactly what's happening in Rwanda. Both Kagame and Meles Zenawi, who was the leader of the TPLF and the president, I mean the Prime Minister of Ethiopia, for years came at the same time, both supported by the West, both claimed the economies were like the fastest growing in Africa, 8% a year, 8% a year, copy paste. A, an ethnic minority running over the whole country in Rwanda, in Ethiopia, same. Um, the, the narrative about them, these are mass murderers. These are people who have invaded their neighbors, both of them. Um, remember Ethiopia had that violent war between Ethiopia and Eritrea in, uh, I believe it was 2000, around the year 2000. It was horrible um, that time. You know, Rwanda has invaded the Congo, um, over, all with the support of the West. When Meles Zenawi died, to finish this point, remember when I said, do you remember who I said blocked the UN mapping report that exposed the genocide that happened in, in the Congo? You remember the name that I mentioned in the Obama administration? Uh, was it Rice or? Uh, yes, Susan okay. Rice. Okay, okay. Guess who wrote a glowing, a glowing obituary to Mela Zenawi when he died? The TPLF leader. Stop Same that. person, Susan Stop Rice. Yes. This is somebody that killed massive numbers of Ethiopians. And yet U.S. Uh, officials were uh, raving about him. So all of this to display that, you know, both... The TPLF are basically, and the RPF are puppets of the West. They're fabrications, you know, of the West as they are right now. They are puppets of the West. And they are destroying not only the people in the countries that they are a part of, but also the people who belong to the same ethnicity as, as them. Because when you look at um, what's happening in Ethiopia, the, there's so many Tigrinya, so many people, pe people in Tigray who are against what the TPLF is doing. Um, so to really connect the dots, this no more movement speaks so much, not only to Ethiopia, but to Rwanda, to the Great Lakes region of Africa, 
and also to the whole African continent and the global African all over, wherever we are, in Haiti, in Jamaica, in, in Bar, uh, Barbados, by the way. You know, glad they got rid of the, you know, being a part of the kingdom and are mm -hmm. now uh, an independent public. Um, in, you name it, in Cuba, whatever, whatever part of the world that we're in as a global African, in Brazil, in Colombia, you know, the US, have, the US uh, definitely, US. the US has the largest black population outside of, um, you know, outside of Africa, I think, yeah, well, um, yeah. you know, it's, think, it's um, in, it, it must be in the top 10. You yeah, know. Brazil, India, a yeah. few different spots. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So for me, when I look at the type of exploitation that we're undergoing, the TPLF and the RPF are agents of the West, just like we have sellouts within our communities who serve in the oppression of our people. And, and, and to me, that's the big similarity and, and they are supported by those who uphold the systems of oppression. And, then, and when we talk about the dismantling, uh, and the dismantling of the um, of systemic racism, that includes includes dismantling the the puppets and the uh, supporters of such systems, and those include the RPF and the TPLF. You know. Um... Man, it, it's definitely, um, you know, I mean, when you talk about similarities in the playbook, you know, they just adjust it for wherever they at. You know what I'm saying? It's like these imperialists, depending on who the colonizer is, the chief colonizers, they might change the language. And it's like they got one big book and this, this is in Portuguese. This is in French. This is in English. This is in Spanish. You know what I'm saying? And it, it, it's the same thing here in the United States and folks can't see um, the connection. And it's important, like you said, to connect the dots because of the fact that, you know, you had just this past uh, past year, you had all these folks in the street talking about Black Lives Matter. You know what I'm saying? Which was empty sloganeering and it was an opportunity for uh, uh, white folks to say that, you know, I'm cool. You know what I'm saying? I, I support, you know, you know, they shouldn't kill black folks in the streets of Atlanta or Oakland or uh, New York or wherever the case is. But we're talking about genocide on a much larger scale. And we talk about Black Lives Matter, but that doesn't go outside of the United States. When they say Black Lives Matter, they're not talking about Haiti. They're not talking about Cuba. They're not talking about Rwanda. They're not talking about the Congo. They're not talking about Ethiopia. You know what I'm saying? They're talking about, you know, let me, let, let's get these uh, slaves over here cool. You guys happy? All right. Don't worry about them over there. They, they, you know, they beefing with each other. You know what I'm saying? So just like with this whole hashtag no more thing, I think that it, it, it's, it's a great start. But we have to. Um, it is jo the job of the uh, of the organizers to uh, figure out how to make that connection. So, in saying that, I'm definitely glad to uh, to have you two on because of the fact that you know it's. I'm hearing the same thing from from all over the planet. You know what I mean? Folks in Cuba and Venezuela, so on and so forth, and and they're all saying like, you know, we we have to connect. We got to do this. We got to do that. So. Um, you know, I'm, I'm looking forward to uh, to more work. I want to ask uh, in closing, um, and and we're definitely going to have you all back on here. Um, I want to want to um, ask about you know what do you all feel can be done from this side of the uh, of of the water? You know what I'm saying? How can we uh, yeah get mm -hmm. these words out? Get these names out? Uh, yeah, pretty much. I think the most important thing is raising awareness because a lot, uh, you can't uh, start fighting for something if you don't know exactly what's going on. And I, for now, we are doing a good job, like having a platform like Black Power Media, where we can actually uh, tell our own stories and tell what is going on. Th this is a good start. 
Uh, and then also, uh, I, I feel like the more we raise awareness and then we start taking actions, like we, uh, by talking to, I, I mean, uh, you know, finding like, uh, like telling America what is happening and start uh, advocating for our brothers in Africa, our, our brothers worldwide in, in, in uh, Caribbean, in America, you know, and tell our, our, the, these American leaders to stop sponsoring uh, these rebellions, to stop sponsoring this terrorist group in Africa because they are terrorist groups that they are being sponsored by the West. So we need to start targeting our authorities, especially in these countries that are sponsoring them. We need to start uh, uh, showing exactly to the world what they are doing and confront them with what they are doing and um, see, hopefully with that, we're gonna have some change happening. Yeah, I also believe that if a successful revolution has to be global and in order for it to be global, the globe has to know and i think um it's 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 important you know as nadine said i'm really echoing and driving home the point of raising awareness because knowledge is power it's important that people know as they start then once people know then they can take the right action because right now because there's so much ignorance st sticking with just rwanda you know without going into the the wider bigger picture of systemic ra racism and why it must be dismantled. But if we just speak about Rwanda and Kagame, most people have only heard the propaganda that comes from uh, Western, uh, the, the dominant narrative, the Western dominant narrative and from Kagame. And they do not know how much he's destroyed black lives and black people and Africa and the Great Lakes region of Africa the origin of life, you know, in a place with so much potential for, you know, to the whole world for his own benefit, the benefit of his little clique and the benefit of the West. And until people understand and know who he is, people will continue to take, you know, to defend him and take incorrect action. And so <clears throat> that's where it starts, you know, making sure that people know. So that's why I'm so grateful for the platform, grateful that we able to have this conversation and, and be able to share with, you know, with so many audiences. And then the next steps will be, um, you know, to me, it has to lead to radical change of, you know, systemic change, you know, not just, you know, um, Rwanda's changed, but Burundi still has problems and Congo still has problems, you know, and things like that. It has to be a global approach. You know, as much as we think locally and act locally, it must be, you know, uh, toward the goal of a global uh, global change. But again, to take that action, we must understand what's the game, who are the players, who's doing what, and where have we been fooled? I want to end with this. When we listen to Twistery, which is the story of the West and Kagame, for example, you know, which is history twisted, you know, um, I don't want to butcher it, so let me, let, me, let me pull it up to make sure I got it right. Um, when uh, when we listen to Twistery. You about to read a poem, uh, Claude? Claude it's not a poem. To... We got to look at who's no telling the story, no doubt. who has the power, whose voices are left out, Who's benefiting from the voices being left out? You know, uh, so I wanted to make sure that I, I hit all of those points. And what we are dealing with now is twistery. And what you are doing and what this platform is doing is undoing, is untwisting that twistery into real story, history, our story. No doubt. Well, we, we're doing that together. And that's the, uh, the reason why we have a Black Power Media, you know what I mean, so that we can get... Uh, as much uh, proper, I hate to use that propaganda. You know what I'm saying? The proper <laughs> information. Like propaganda. Out. Yeah. yeah, yeah. We we need we have to be able to, uh, like you said, tell our own story, man. And I, I'm definitely uh, grateful that you all uh, were had enough faith and confidence in coming on the platform because of the fact that, you know, for myself as as an organizer, as a activist or a quote unquote freedom fighter, I've been on many platforms where uh 
we we start off on one page and before long folks are trying to twist your words and you're getting into debates and all kinds of bs you know what i'm saying all kinds of bullshit you know what i mean and you know you know so i, I appreciate I, I don't take uh any of our guests or our audience for granted because of the fact that you know for me this is uh our time is the most valuable resource we have you know what i'm saying and we don't know how much time we have so for anyone to even sit here and and speak to us or even listen you know what i mean to me it, it's an honor and it's a privilege it's not just you know I, i'm not on bullshit, so i'm not really interested in knowing you know about what kanye next album's about or no kind of crazy shit like that i'm trying to find out where are we strategically and how are we going to win because of the fact that we owe our ancestors, you know what I'm saying? And we owe our generations to come. And I'm under the strong belief that uh, we will prevail in spite of, despite all the bullshit going on, we will prevail. So uh, with that said, definitely, you already know. It will prevail. Know. Indeed. So just know that, um, you know, Black Power Media is another home for you all. You know what I'm saying? And uh, we're looking forward and to also, bringing it in. There is one thing I wanted to add on uh, because uh, uh, like right now, there is this movement where we have, which is great. We have a lot of African-American wanting to move back to Africa. It's great, but I feel like they should also know the history of where, because I've seen some already in Rwanda and giving all these praises to Rwanda. But I'm like, you know, there are people suffering, but you will never know because you, you know, they want to show you that good picture so you can come, you can bring your money in Rwanda. But I feel like also, you, uh, when, uh, like, they also should be aware of where they are going, the history, uh, who is doing what. And uh, so that way, because if you want to make the Africa great, if you want the black race to succeed, uh, we should not just um, focus on one area, you know, because maybe, okay, my life is bad in the United States. I'm going to Africa. I feel better there. But you should also kind of look around and, and make sure everyone, you know, everybody around you is also in, uh, in uh, having the same feeling like you are. Just same as us in the United States, as Africans who live in the United States, you know, when injustice is being committed towards the African-American, we should feel the same way as African Americans are feeling. We should fight together against the injustice. So, yeah, that's one thing I wanted to add on. I'm gonna correct you on one thing. Mm -hmm. um, we are not Africans, African Americans. We are Africans in America. So you got to keep that. <laughs> you know, we we we, 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 we yeah. didn't come here. Many of us didn't come here willingly. So absolutely, you know, absolutely. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> you 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 messing up the solidarity already, Nate. <laughs> no. He's halfway there. So my I apologies. You, my apologies. I, I should have gave you a smoke yeah. break. But anyway. <laughs> <laughs> I already had I already had my vegetables before hey, I, I already know. Hey, you see Claude disappeared, tell me he had to close the window. Yeah. Anyway. <laughs> you know, hey, you gotta but, take the rate the breaks when you need them, right? <laughs> no doubt, no doubt. But definitely, man. Revolutionary love. Yeah. Yes, now it's all, all good. We, yeah, 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 yeah. You tripping yeah. now. Like, hold on. <laughs> you got you got us thinking we rolling with Andy Jackson. I mean Andy Young or something. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> but anyway, um, definitely we appreciate you all coming on. Uh, let's stay in tune, stay in touch. Uh, for folks that are checking us out, you know, it didn't cost you nothing to be here, but a few brain cells. But your task and your homework is to make sure go to YouTube, tweet, retweet, retweet, retweet post, uh, and whatever it is you have to do. Because we always talking about we need our own propaganda and the West is not reporting our story. Look, we already put the platform together. We got the players. Now put it out there. Let folks know that it exists so that we can, uh, you know, keep it going on. And it's not about, for the record, it's not about a numbers thing. It's about this is part of our, our, our re-education process. This is part of the political education because of the fact that now we all have learned something from here. And shout out to the uh, to the comrades in the chat. I know that uh, I've seen a couple folks that said they were a part of the uh, 
uh, they survived the genocide as well and survived the wars. So salute to you as well. We're glad that you're here. We're glad that you all survived. And, um, you know, we're going to be here to victory. All right. Checking out Riot Starter TV. We were joined by my man Claude and Nadine in the building. And, uh, you know, you'll see more of them. We're going to get them their own show on Black Power Media. I'm going to just put it out there. Just put them. Right. <laughs> We're gonna get get them their own show so they can go in and, and and do what they do. But um, definitely stay on the right side of the barricades, and we'll catch you all in a few ticks. Appreciate Ryan Starter TV, yeah. Black Power Media, salute. Salute. We'll see you all later on. You know what it is. Check us out tomorrow. Remix morning show, early in the morning, eight to ten a.m. EST. Yeah. Black Power Media.